Some of you may have had that exact same reaction when you saw the video title. And to those that did, I don't blame you one bit. As much as one of Rooster Teeth's big animated web series Ruby has gained commercial success, it has equally, if not more so, been met with harsh criticism for a long while now. Contrary to what fans presume, the show has been lambasted and ridiculed since Volume 1 premiered. First, it started with anime critics outside of the already established fan base via tweets and certain articles. Nowadays, the negative feedback has shifted altogether to within the show's established following in recent years. The show's current core, and to a lesser extent its overall production staff, have been especially condemned for how the show has been handled for a number of reasons. And to say that portions of the fan base have put forth their own frustrations in response to wave after wave of criticisms would be an understatement. However, one issue that has stood out in particular is something that has been more widely argued from different people within the fan base who have felt compelled to drop the show altogether. The phrasing may vary from person to person, but the statement basically goes along the lines of this. Ruby has stopped following Monty Ohm's vision. Ever since Monty Ohm, the creator of Ruby, passed away at the very young age of 33 on February 1st, 2015, Fans have expressed rather fair concern over whether the show will continue past Volume 2 and if it will still feel engaging. While Volume 3's reception was overall positive, one former animator from the staff was very disheartened with what supposedly went on behind the scenes. In a lengthy document from said animator that elaborates his personal experience working on Volume 3, one part stated, They work continuously to convince the contract animators and staff who are unaware of the truth of these things in order to keep them pumped up and motivated. They say, what an honor. No, this is not an honor. This is a company IP you are working on. It is no longer Monty's Ruby. It is something different. And people could already see that without a single word from me. It is what it is. And what it has turned into is something I don't want anything to do with. Although the open letter did gain a lot of the fan base's attention, most who did read it took what was presented with a grain of salt, ultimately feeling unsure about the perspective of said animator's story. However, with each passing volume since the fourth installment in October 2016, that sentiment started to slowly etch into many fans' minds due to their disappointment with the show's presentation for failing to deliver on what they watched Ruby for. The Kruby, the nickname coined to refer to Ruby's production staff, were under thin ice by Volume 5, and in the eyes of a sizable amount of viewers, the last several episodes of Volume 6 was what caused the ice to shatter and have them sink. That wound up marking the last straw with some fans, the point where Ruby was considered irredeemable in their eyes. And it was here that the claim that the Kruby are simply not following Montium's vision anymore was at an all-time high. From an outsider's perspective, this collective boiling point reaction and the arguments supporting them, past and present, may seem fair and even quote unquote valid, as some would say. And perhaps there was quite a bit of truth within the letter previously mentioned. That being said, given how much the fandom has accumulated after the late creator's passing, with new faces binging the show during or after every premiering volume, there is one question worth raising. Do fans even know what Montium's vision actually was? What do you mean? In case this was not already made obvious, it's important to state for the record that I never knew Montium personally, nor have I ever met him. Hell, I've never even heard of him until around the time the Red trailer was first released to the public. To raise the question of what Montium's intentions were for Ruby would no doubt rub a good portion of the fandom the wrong way, and for good reason. When some grab their virtual soapboxes and claim, or at the very least imply, 
to all that they know precisely what Monty wanted in his show, to the point where they give off the impression that they know even more than anyone within the crew we do, it's only natural that many other fans in response would find that disrespectful to the late creator himself. Having said that, at the risk of making a rather bold statement, I don't honestly believe whether one knew Monty personally or not is necessarily required to have this discussion. It's important to understand that we're talking about someone that was generally very open about his own work, be it through written interviews, video interviews, podcasts, live streams, journal entries, and behind the scenes, Monty wasn't afraid to share insights regarding Ruby itself and his creative process and workflow. The only times he chose not to reveal anything was for the sake of not spoiling would-be fans of his show as it was developing. And just about all this information can be found on the internet, meaning that whatever I've come to understand about his vision for Ruby can also be accessed by anyone else. The only sources that are not as easily available are those via a paywall. This includes audio commentary tracks and whatever behind the scenes exclusive to the show's Blu-ray sets, videos of Ruby behind the episode during Volume Five's production, and interviews on certain episodes of Ruby Rewind on Rooster Teeth's website. And even then, those sources can be accessed through roughly one full day's worth of a paycheck. Right now, Volumes 1-5 through 5 of Ruby have all been available on Blu-ray in one set via Right Stuff for under $30. As important as it is to be respectful of Monty whenever the matter of making outlandish claims about his dream project pops up, I don't think shutting down any discussion outright is necessarily the best long-term solution. Rather than simply saying Ruby was his passion project and leaving it at that, it's worth shedding as much light as possible by contextualizing whatever information is out there in order to hopefully have a more insightful discussion on the matter. With all that said, what exactly did Montiel envision when initiating what would be one of Rusatit's biggest titles? To dig into the answer to a seemingly simple sounding question, it is best to get a good idea of when and how things started. Dialing back to July of 2011, Rooster Teeth at Studio 636 was neck deep in the production of Season 9 of Red vs. Blue. One night, Monty Ohm, who was one of the show's animators and the same animator who I mentioned earlier that wrote the open letter, went to eat at an IHOP after a day of working on RVB. It was then that Monty decided to do something on a whim. He took a napkin and a bottle of ketchup, then squirted ketchup into that napkin and crumbled it. What he would then display may seem to have been something out of grade school arts and crafts to some, but in actuality, this ketchup stained napkin would serve to be the initial design for the map of the world of Remnant. Also, in case anyone ever wondered about the following, yeah. We've covered this before like at the conventions, this. but uh, uh, for the people on the stream today, Monty, why do all the continents look like dragons? That was a coincidence. This was before the Red trailer, the show's main characters, and even the show's title were officially created. And the ideas and recruitment process for the show proper wouldn't kick off until June of 2012, roughly one year later. By that point, Rooster Teeth was in the middle of production for Red vs. Blue's milestone 10th season. At some point, Montiel went to then compositor, machinimator, sound editor, and visual effects artist for RVB season 10. Carrie Sharcross and proposed something interesting. Now, whenever fans express what they believe to be the reason Montiel made Ruby, one off-the-cuff answer is probably along the lines of, he wanted an excuse to make cool fight scenes. Since Carrie was one of the first people Monty directly consulted to about wanting to make Ruby though, what did he say was the initial motivation? He came in, uh, you know, late, but just because he was there overnight. Uh, and he was still kind of like half awake and he just walked up to me and he said, red, white, black, yellow. And I said, yes, Monty, those are four colors. <laughs> and he said, no, that's a team. They're four girls. And I said, yes, Monty, go back to sleep. And then the next day he was like, hey, we should make an anime. And I was like, yes, that sounds great. I like anime, you like anime, let's make a show. This would pretty much match Monty's answer to how Ruby had officially got going, though there is an official tweet indicating he was even brainstorming character names since late April of 2012. 
Uh, it was Red vs. Blue Season 10. Uh-huh. Carrie and I were just watching a lot of anime on our time, late uh, late nights at the office. Mm -hmm. And I was showing him some like tests I was doing. Right. And we were like, yeah, we should totally do this. And I'm like, yeah, we should. Okay. And then so I, after we finished Season 10 of Red vs. Blue, I put together a test mm -hmm. which became the Red Trailer. And I showed it to Bernie and he said, you should totally do this. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Soon after, Monty and Carrie went to Miles Luna, who was credited for being a visual effects artist, sound editor, and co-writer for RVB Season 10, and the episodes he wrote for the show were among fan favorites too, namely episodes 12 and 18, titled Out of Mind and Change of Plans, respectively. You're my problem! You've always been my problem! Each and every one of you is just a problem that I have to deal with on a daily basis! It was then that they showed him test footage of what would be Ruby Rose supposedly twirling her scythe around. Although Miles was initially overwhelmed by the offer at first, due to the amount of ideas Carrie and Monty told him for the show all while working on RVB, eventually he was on board. My earliest Ruby memory is um, <clears throat> I was working uh, at, when we were at our old office, I was upstairs by my lonesome working on Red vs. Blue Machinima while all the animators were down in our studio. And every now and then I'd walk down and I'd see Monty working on like some crazy scythe thing. And I'm like, I don't know what the hell that's all about, but I'm digging it. Uh, and then one day we all wanted to go out and get lunch and Monty and Carrie like approached. And they're like, hey, <laughs> we had our robes on. Like, right, hey, like a tome. Hey, we got man and threw him in the, the drove off. Yeah. That sounds about right. Yeah. Yeah. It, was more like, it was more like, hey, we're gonna go to Texas Land and Cattle and get some steak. You want to come? And I was like, Yeah! yeah. It's it a bunch of like. Yeah, sure, it, it was like it was like, uh, Little Red Riding Hood, Fairy Tale influence, team names, color names. There's a world and it's crazy. Did I mention Sniper Scythe? And I was like, Whoa! I, um, I'm dealing with some red and blue Space Marines right now. Yeah, that right. sounds really, really cool. Uh, Get back to me on that. And they they worked on developing some stuff. And then um, at the beginning, it was just a lot of like. Here's an idea. Here's another idea. Yeah. Here's another idea that breaks the first two ideas. So, but that one's cooler. So let's do that. Said. Yeah. yeah. It's just a lot of just like, what do we like? What do we think is yeah. the coolest? Like all of us will just keep throwing in ideas. Like, what if we go this way with it? What do we go that way with it? Mm -hmm. um, and eventually, the three of us all decided on a few set rules and characters mm -hmm. and um, story ideas that we wanted to stick to. And then at one point, we all kind of decided, okay, Monty's working on like action and like the d design and the look of the show and he kind of ha had us go off and start writing uh the first episode yeah and the idea was he was going to show uh matt and bernie the uh owners and founders of rooster teeth he was going to show them the the first trailer that he made and then we were going to back it up with the script and essentially we were just going to go ah? now just a moment ago i mentioned that monty already had test footage of ruby rose and her weapon if you watch or read enough interviews and panel Q&As from Monty Ohm, you'll hear variations of the same answer regarding his ideas for the show. Some ideas I came with recently, while others I had for years. Uh, there's like two answers to that question. You know, long answer is I've always wanted to make it. Short answer is, I don't know, last June I came up with the name and started assigning the ideas I've always had to the things I've always wanted to do. This is relevant partly because Monty already had initial designs of the members of Team Ruby for the first concept artist he would consult to work on the project. That artist would of course be Ian Lee. This is something I do, by the way, so if you're an artist, be wary or be happy. Um, I look at art all the time and if your stuff gets noticed, I'll notice it because I noticed Ian Lee about seven years ago and I said, I love her stuff. And I would just look at her stuff and say, Someday I'm going to work for this because it just so, so much of her stuff had texture and an emotion to it. It's like this is perfect, and so I actually made I actually did some early tests several years ago. But when Ruby started getting going, I was like, should I contact her? <laughs> when recruited to work on the show, she wound up finalizing the designs Monty Ohm initially had for every member of Team Ruby and Team Juniper, Roman Torchwick with Miles and Carrie's input, and Ozpin, Linda and Cinder's designs, among other things by herself. The next concept artist was Patrick Rodriguez, who would be brought on to design props, vehicles, and much of the creatures of Grimm. I'd been aware of Patrick's stuff, and we'd talked about uh, 
bringing him on board, but you know we needed a, a, a better reason than you know it's, you know just you know a, a third commission merchandise. And then when a, a position was necessary for a, a full-time concept artist, right? Yeah. That that then I, we were like, okay, let's get Patrick on board. Finally, Christina Wen was the third concept artist who would provide the designs for the setting of Veil vale and would eventually be the art director for Volume Two. This is the, I mean, I'd followed her work for a long time. We'd met through cosplay, actually. And, uh, and then I, I, I followed the thread to her work. And um, I'd seen how cool and s simple it was. Yes. She does so much with so little, and it's this imaginary world that has such, such emotion in its design. And I mean, we'd been friends for a long time. And uh, like I said, I watch people. And I'll, if I'm talking to you about stuff, that means that might lead to something someday. I'm just looking for the place for it. And uh, so, you know, when the time came when you needed a concept artist, I mean, it, we pulled the trigger on this fast. When it came to casting characters, Monty went to Lindsay Jones, Kara Eberly, and Barbara Dunkelman to ask to be cast or at least audition as Ruby, Weiss, and Yang after the Red Trailer came out, while Aaron Zek was brought on by Miles to audition for Blake specifically by showing Monty how she speaks in French. Um, I was not approached by Monty. Miles actually came up to me and was like, hey, so Monty's doing this this show thing, um, and I know that you've got this background in, in acting and voice, and and you've got all these accents and things because I'm really stupid and do stuff like that. Whenever I'm <gasps> do an it. accent. Yeah. What could I say? Um, je sais pas qu'est-ce que je veux dire. Miles Luna then at some point expressed interest in playing a character himself and auditioned using three types of voices. Jean, Jean was a collective effort. Oh no, I'm saying like we, we when you first did reads, and I was like, we need a, like a soccer character. We did uh what happened was I, I told my I was like, we brought, you know what it is? We brought Aaron in. We brought it was me and Aaron one night. You were like, I was like, Monty, I'm gonna be real with you. I want to voice a character in this show. So I went in and I did a bunch of different guy voices. We did the cool guy voice. Uh -huh. We did a tough guy voice. I did a serious guy voice, and of course. I got stuck with the nerdy guy voice. That's what I'm talking about. And yeah, and then from there we were like, I, I remember hearing your laugh outside. This is what, so I'm doing lines in here. La 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 la, John, John, John. And then outside of here. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and that's how I knew I was like, okay, so I think I'm gonna be, I think I'm gonna be stuck with the nerdy character. <laughs> Between voice casting, going through concept artwork, adding in, flushing out, and sorting out ideas, themes, and stories for the show, and having Jeff and Casey Williams on board to provide music for the Red Trailer, who had already been collaborating with Rooster Teeth on seasons 8 through 10 of Red vs. Blue, the planning process for the show had lasted from the entire latter half of 2012 into the first few months of 2013. The earliest known confirmation that the actual animation of Volume 1's production started was of a tweet on April 9th of 2013 from animator Dustin Matthews, who was already involved with Red vs. Blue Season 10 and would first animate Ruby and Yang's interaction on the airship in Episode 1. Following that tweet three days later was Montiel confirming that reviews of the animation stage had started, and then even later that month, teasing a frame for when Ruby fought Junior's men in Episode 1. All of this was while he worked on the Yellow trailer at the same time. I just I, re I remember it was like you got through the rest of it the, the the first part before this and you're like I don't know I think it needs more and we're like oh I mean okay we got like another thirty seconds we can add like we got some time and, this, and we were like making this for RTX yeah and I, I was pretty much working on the Yang trailer at the same time as this episode yeah, yeah. you were yep. the Yellow trailer would then premiere on June first at Acon in Dallas Texas while Volume One initially premiered at RTX on July fifth twenty thirteen and then officially premiered online on the 18th, and the rest was history. This is all just scratching the surface, however, as there's a lot more to this web series than just the timeline of its development. Since there's so much ground to cover about just this one topic, it's only natural to divide into three parts, with this video essentially being part one. Stay tuned for part two, where all the different concepts applied to Ruby are made clear.